like to bring on uh, our authors and the moderators on stage. I would like to introduce, firstly, uh, Mr. Ranjit Lal. Uh, sir, can you please uh, join us on stage? Uh, Mr. Ranjit Lal was born in Calcutta. Can we have a big round of applause? Continue the applause, ladies and gentlemen, ladies, yeah, especially. Uh, born in Calcutta in 1955 and educated in Mumbai, graduating in economics and sociology. As a freelance writer and columnist over the last 30 years, he has had well over 1,500 articles and short stories, features and photo features published in over 50 newspapers and magazines in India and abroad. His book, Faces in the Water on Subject of Female Infanticide, won the Vodafone Crossword Award for Children's Writing in 2010 and the Largely Media Award, National Award for Gender Sensitivity 2012. He was honored by EB in 2012 for the same title. Welcome to the state, sir. Welcome to the festival. Our next author is Ms. Santini Govindan. Ma'am, please uh, join us on stage. Santini Govindan is a widely published, award-winning author of children's literature in English. She's written more than 30 books for children of all ages, including poetry, picture books, and short stories. Many of Ms. Govindan's books are now used as, read, uh, as readers uh, at schools across India. She's a consulting editor for a well-known children's magazine and has taught creative writing at the undergraduate level at Mumbai University. Welcome to the Literature Festival, ma'am. And I would like to call upon Mr. Jonathan Long on stage. Mr. Jonathan Long um, is principal for Woodstock. Uh, he has had a wealth of experience in education and learning after more than 30 years of working in schools in South Africa, the United Kingdom, Switzerland, and India. Prior to his arrival at Woodstock in January 2012, Dr. Long was principal of Mahindra United World College India, an international school in Pune. We welcome you to the festival, Dr. Long. And finally, I would like to invite the moderator of the session, Ms. Priyanka Bhattacharya. Ma'am, please welcome. Ms. Priyanka Bhattacharya is an alumnus of Lady Brabourne, that's how I, I'm sorry, uh, Brabourne College, Calcutta, where she uh, read English literature and of the Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi, where she pursued her MA and MPhil in linguistics. She's been involved in research and copywriting and editing for design projects with the National Institute of Design, uh, Ahmedabad, where she lived and worked between 2000 and 2004. She taught mass communication and broadcasting at St. Xavier's College, Ahmedabad, and then switched to school teaching in 2004. She taught for a well year at Wellams Boys School, Dehradun, and joined Doon School in 2005. Her interests lie in all, the nourishes that, uh, the, all that nourishes the life of the mind, literature, arts, and music. Welcome to the festival, ma'am. Please give a big round of applause for all of them, and let's start this session. Thank you. A very good afternoon and a very warm welcome. Warm is a pun, as you realize. A uh, very warm welcome to this session. Uh, we have already been talking to each other, uh, one another, for nearly an hour. And uh, we've had a wonderful discussion uh, on the place of children's literature, children's narratives, young adult fiction. So you've already heard about the author's biographies. So without further ado, I'd first like uh, each of them to speak a little bit about, you know, what is it that uh, they are interested about passionately? What makes them connected to children and young adults' lives? They'll speak about that first and then we'll start asking them some questions. Ma'am. Okay, it's great to be here again. And uh, I must warn you right from the beginning that uh, I never really wanted to be an author or a writer. I wanted to do automobile engineering and design. But due to certain sort of health issues, that was uh, thrown out of the window. And I, was, I always enjoyed writing. So I started writing for the press and articles and all that. Well, somebody said, write a book. So I said, okay, I mean, you know, authors are, if you write a book, it means, you know, you're on a different sort of planet. But I started, I was very interested in things like birds and animals and nature and all that. So I did my first book called The Crow Chronicles, which was a sort of a political satire based in the Bharatpur National Park, using birds as characters. And uh, 
I enjoyed myself thoroughly. It, well, I started off as I imagined authors would start off, meaning I took two years to do about one third of the book. And then I found that, that you know, this is not going anywhere. Either I throw it in, down the toilet or I finish it. So I sat down and finished the rest of it in three months. And uh, I enjoyed myself thoroughly. The next book I did was a book called The Life and Times of Altu Faltu. Now, I, there's a little bit of background here. I, you know, we come from Bombay to Delhi. And I knew nobody in Delhi at that time. And where we lived, there were a lot of monkeys. And these monkeys were making life hell for everybody. And uh, I said, well, right. And I didn't like people in Delhi very much. So I said, well, here's a story. So I created this little absolutely vagabond little monkey. We've been having them running around. I've been thinking of him all day uh, on the roof over here. Um, called Altu Fatu, who's addicted to cough linguses, <laughs> complete wastrel. He falls in love with Rani Beti, who is the daughter of the monkey chieftain of the Flagstaff Tower, <laughs> which is a historic place in Delhi, very close to where I stay. So it what follows is a complete soap opera. <laughs> and, you know, these were books apparently written for adults. Then I got feedback that, you know, 10-year-old and 11-year-old kids were enjoying this thoroughly. And then I said, yeah, you know, because I enjoy writing like that. So I, was, I started writing for kids. And people, even now, you know, when you say you write for children, they sort of say, oh, but why don't you write for adults? You know, that's a proper way of writing. <laughs> you know, writing for kids doesn't count. Now, I think it counts far more than people imagine. Because if children did not read as children, they are not going to read as adults. And if they are not going to read for, as adults, there's going to be no adult writers. True. Because they won't have an audience. Mm. True. Thank you so much, Ms. Govindan. Um, so, uh, mine uh, is a little different from his. Ever since I can remember, I wanted to be a writer. It was never anything else. I was in love with the written word, with the spoken word, right from the time I was a little girl. So, I think I'm fortunate that, you know, I never wanted to be an astronaut or an engine driver or a paleontologist. It was always a writer. But um, as I grew up, so I thought all you have to do is sit down and write. And then miraculously, your writings are going to be turned into books. When you grow up, you realize that it's not so easy. In fact, it's quite a struggle to be a writer. Many children come up to me and say, so one of the good things about being a writer is that you learn to take rejection. Because rejection, these are one of the things that goes with the territory. In fact, there was um, one of the children's book writers, he sent his manuscript 177 times before it was accepted. So he dedicated the book to persistence. <laughs> so that's a good human quality that you don't give up. So if you, any of you want to uh, be a writer, one important quality is that you can't give up. There are always going to be people who don't like your writing. Like, it's like food. Some people like sweets, some people like pickles, some people like bitter things. So, some people are going to enjoy your writing, some people are not. But you can't take it personally. You must be ready to accept the criticism from those who don't like your work. Maybe try and see if there's something constructive that you can learn from them. Um, as Mr. Lal said, I think the most important audience in the world are children. I think you've all been, you, most of you are reading the newspapers and you see the way the world is headed, the geographical and the economic situation, the tilt. I believe in the next 10 to 20 years, a woman or a man or maybe women and men from India are going to be the most important leaders of the free world. Maybe some of you. So what you read will influence what you do. True. When you are in a position of power, mm. not necessarily a politician. True. Please don't think that they are the only people who have power. True. Because they may have perceived power. Mm. But even other people, even a small villager mm. has power to influence the lives of others. Mm. So what you read is important because that will influence what you do. And you should always do things that are beneficial, not only for yourself, but for your community and for mankind. Mm. So that's why I think the space that I am in is so important. Mm. 
and I'm grateful that I got this opportunity. Thanks so much. Dr. Long. Well, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yours? <laughs> good afternoon, everybody. It's lovely to be here. I'm sitting here this afternoon as an educator and not as an author and writer. My interest is in young people and in schools. But when I think about the world of young people and the world of education, the thing that interests me most is this. All of us inherited a world in which we have learned that the greatest problems we face are local. They're problems defined by geographical boundaries, language, creed, color, culture. But as an educator and someone who is passionate about young people and what they read, I actually believe that the greatest challenges we face in education and in literature are not necessarily local, but they are global. The greatest threats facing humanity are not the local problems, but the problems of humanity. And therefore, my great passion is this, that we develop young people who have a global mindedness, who are citizens of the world, young people who can face those challenges with a deep commitment to their local circumstances, but with a very, very powerful obligation to the world that we've inherited. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, so you've heard from them, uh, you know, what uh, moves them and uh, actuates their writing. And we were speaking just now about the space of storytelling in this world. Uh, Mr. Lal already spoke about it. He said, well, if you don't read as a child, there is not much chance of you reading as an adult. Uh, but I'd just like uh, our panelists to dwell a little bit about... Uh, what is the space that children's storytelling and children's narratives um, holds, especially in this world, which is so riven by war, by people still bombing children's hospitals. You know, we only have to open a newspaper today and uh, close it immediately because you're probably going to get a feast in horror. The adults have done a pretty messy job in preserving the world. So, um, in this world, when we hand this world on a platter to our children, what is the space of storytelling here? Mr. Lal, would you want to speak on it? Well, uh, you can write about uh, a lot of these issues in ways that uh, would maybe appeal to children. Like, for example, one of the books that I did was called Faces in the Water. Mm -hmm. Now, that is about female infanticide. Now, this story came about, I read this uh, news, news report Again, something you open the newspaper and you see something horrible. And it was about this thing happening in, amongst very rich families in Haryana. Mm. It was not the poor, the downtrodden, or anything like that. They were very rich. So I sort of said that now, you know, how can I write a story for children illustrating this theme mm. without grossing everybody out completely? Mm. Because it's a horrible subject. Mm. And then I thought back that, you know, I had two sisters one older, one younger. So I always say I'm the rose between two thorns. <laughs> but uh, then I just thought that one day that what sort of a life would I had as a child had they not been there? Had they been taken away? And then immediately, you know, all the fun and games, all the fighting, all the teasing, all the, you know, grabbing thing for things, all that would have disappeared. And you would have been sitting there by yourself doing what? You know? Feeling, I mean, you may not feel miserable, but you're missing out on so much. So that's how I then molded that story. Because it's basically about this little boy who goes to his ancestral farm and he looks down this well. And he sees the faces of three little girls looking up at him. And they tell him that they're, the three, they're his three sisters who had been drowned from birth. And they start showing him the kind of life he would have had 
had they been allowed to live, which is a much better life than the one that he is currently sort of living. Such a powerful thing. Uh, I mean, uh, books like that ought to be standard reading in any school uh, across the country. Uh, that's what our uh, youngsters need to read. In fact, we were speaking about it. Uh, Ms. Govindan wants to say something about that book as well. Yeah, so the book, um, Faces in the Water, is an exceptional book because it deals with um, a sad, a, a terrifying subject, but in a very light and humorous way. Mm -hmm. And I had used the book when I had gone for a conference on gender equality, and there were lots of children in the audience, and I used it because all the children, all of you, are someday going to be parents. So it's important that you know that when you have a son or a daughter, they are both equal. There is a son is not in any way superior to a daughter, and vice versa. They are both individuals, and they're capable of performing at the same level. So, unfortunately, female infanticide is one of the terrible realities of life, mm -hmm. but we have to face it so that we can make sure in the world that when you grow up and you become parents, maybe you will welcome all children with the same excitement that they need to be welcomed. Uh, Dr. Long was talking about the moral universe uh, of children. He deals with young people. Uh, I mean, it's his, it's his career. And he was speaking about the place of storytelling in, in shaping this moral universe. I'd just like him to speak a little bit on it. Thank you. I think human beings are profoundly storytelling creatures. If we could go back in time 25,000, 30,000 years, as the sun set, our ancient ancestors sat around fires, not only for warmth and light, but also to tell and listen to stories. And those stories passed on the ancient wisdom, the traditions. And so it is today. I believe that it's through stories, through narrative, that we create our identity, we form our values, we shape our communities. It is through stories, and I say stories and not technology deliberately, and not the video screen, but through the pages of books and through storytelling that we find our humanity. So I believe that storytelling is the most significant, one of the most significant features of what it is to be a human being and how we discover what it is to be human. And there are many versions of that story. And the survival of the human race depends on us finding and telling the right story. Wonderful. In fact, uh, long ago, I, I was part of a conference on storytelling at the NID. And the t-shirt they printed was that the universe is not made of atoms. It is made of stories. You know, I still have the t-shirt. I am many sizes too big for it anymore. But the wisdom of the t-shirt lives, you know. <laughs> it's kept that the universe is indeed made of stories, you know. Uh, so especially because, uh, you know, children are the inheritors of that universe. Therefore, the space of storytelling. Uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, as adults who are um, writing for children and wanting to pass a message, a certain kind of message, uh, how do you tease out issues and, uh, you know, crises perhaps, or predicaments that children might want to read about. How do you know now, you know, what is it that the children want to read? How do you have that connect with your young audience? Well, the, the one way is uh, you react to something that, ha but that you've read or something that happens, like in Faces in the Water. And the other thing I feel, that, you know, you go back to your own childhood, and you think about the things that really affected you a lot. And for me, for example, one of them was a sense of being done an injustice. When you were, say, punished for something you did not do, or somebody broke a promise, especially if it was your parents, because very often parents make promises and break them left, right, and center. And there's no questioning that. But that sort of a thing does, did affect me a lot. So, I'm, I mean, I thought that, you know, this was one another area where you could sort of write a story. I did a book called Taklu and Shroom. It's about a 17-year-old boy 
whose German shepherd is shot by the prime minister's security. And he swears that he is going to take revenge. And he eventually, in the story, reaches a point where he is able to do that. And he has to take that decision whether to go ahead or, to, or not. So, you know, those were the things that affected, you know, that injust the sense of injustice is something that I think that very few children can really handle. And why should they handle it? Because it's so wrong. It's so patently wrong. So, I mean, those are the sort of things that set you off. Otherwise, there can be any sort of a... Uh, uh, there was an item, for example, in some uh, last year, two years ago, about a male tiger in the Ranthambore National Park who had started looking after his cubs after the mother had died. Now, this is not done in tiger society. It is... You know, you cannot do that. This is, you know, family honor down the drain. You can't. But he did. So I said, here's a story ready made, you know, to, for the writing. So I had this tiger called Sher Bahadur and he has... Uh, and, the, and his uh, sort of partner called... Uh, I've forgotten her name. But uh, she has these four cubs. A male called Zafran, who is, you know, very lordly and all the rest of it. And three little girls called Hasti, Masti and Fasti. <laughs> and the female is shot by poachers. And it is up for the, to the father now to look after these cubs. He says, no way, I'm not doing this. Not my work. They can die, whatever. But then one night, he sees these three little cubs trying to hunt down, or four cubs, a wild boar, which is about four times their size, or five, and is going to squash them all into the mud. No questions asked. And he, he, see, he looks into his youngest daughter's eyes. He can't take it, and he, he attacks. After that, he has to, you know, he's committed. Now he has to look after those little ones. And he is ostracized from tiger society. So that's how the story sort of goes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's something that you read, you react to, mm -hmm. and the story sort of just Wonderful. comes out. I know. You want to say something about this? Uh, yeah. Uh, um, as he said, it's something that you read, something that stays in your mind. Some years ago, I got a fellowship to write historical fiction. So one of the things I was doing research on the Mughal era, and one thing that I found when I was researching Emperor Akbar, he was a great king, he had great interest in many things, but he was illiterate. He didn't know how to read and write. True. So he had a big library, hmm. he was interested, and somebody would read to him. So I wondered, why would uh, an emperor who had so much of power, why did he not know how to read? Then I dug deep and then I found that he probably had dyslexia, hmm. which was unknown at the time. <laughs> so I kept thinking about it. So recently um, I did a story, it was a modern story, and, um, and it has just won a national award with the Children's Book Trust competition. It was a story on magic, but the main character has dyslexia. Hmm. And I wrote this because there are many children who have a problem to read. Hmm. The parents don't even know that there is a condition called dyslexia. True. So they think the child is being lazy, mm. stubborn, mm. obstinate, mm. or just not, you know, willing to work hard. Actually, it's, uh, dyslexia is a condition where your brain is slightly differently wired. Mm. It doesn't mean that you are a dud. On the contrary, Michelangelo was dyslexic. So most dyslexic people, actually, they have got great talents, but they have a slower ability to read. Mm. And I wrote this story because it was a message to the parents. Mm -hmm. If your child cannot read properly, it means you just need to work a little mm. on it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean the child is not clever mm. or... And the more you shout at the child, the child is going to withdraw. True. So I think children's literature is great in that way, to bring in a story form. Uh, an issue which I think even children, sometimes the child thinks, oh, why am I not able to read like all the others? True. Is there something wrong with me? It's not. Everybody is different. You're True. just different. Hmm. But you can read as well as the others <laughs> if a little more work is put into it. Wonderful. Um, we were talking about this. You know, in children's, as, as I grew up myself, as, I mean, I remember being a reader and marveling at children who had so much power and agency. They were solving, you know, uh, mysteries and they seemed to be in control, which I did not seem to have in my life. And in fact, 
a lot of a central function of children's literature is perhaps to depict children with a degree of agency which may be missing in the lives of real children how is that you know how do you see that as empowering how do you create characters or talk about characters to the students that you handle characters with agency with leadership with a, a certain modicum of control and how they influence the world how do you do that in your writing i was just wanting to ask mr lal would you want to answer that uh, well one very simple trick is you get rid of the parents <laughs> <laughs> you send them away on a holiday or you set them somewhere or whatever and you put the drop the kids into the into the water and say now you sink or you swim and then your story comes out of that so that that's a that. very <laughs> simple simple solution to do and yes you know these critics they say yeah yeah very convenient you know mother and father have disappeared they've gone off for a holiday or this that and the other how else do you do it otherwise the mom and pop is going to get are, are going to be there right in your face in the story there's going to be no story because they are not going to allow it to happen so you have to get rid of them i say okay please go on a holiday go somewhere die anything but you have to be out of the way because these kids have to manage this crisis on their own otherwise there's going to be no story yeah wonderful <laughs> have you had this uh, uh, decision have you made the decision ever to send parents away yes, from your marriage i think so um parents uh, unfortunately i judge a lot of poetry writing competitions essay competition so um where i today morning i had a workshop in dr long school so the po- children had to write on the spot the entries were amazing they startled me and they startled the students but unfortunately when the entries are written at home with the parents supervising it's a totally different ball game the parents are very driven to make the child get a prize so many times the parents bring in their thoughts to influence what the child is writing True. and unfortunately we live in a world where everybody wants everything to be superlative you know mm. you want to be richer you want to be smarter and everybody wants to be famous or profitable Yes, I What's once wrote thing? a story called An Ordinary Cat. A cat who just didn't want to do anything but to be ordinary. And one of my husband's colleagues came and told me, you know, I love the story because that's me. I'm an ordinary cat. <laughs> so it's okay to be ordinary. We live in the world now where everyone has to be extraordinary. True. You know what? Sometimes to be an ordinary nice person is the most important thing in the world. True. Yes. True, you're the unknown about, citizen. You're talking about the superheroes. <laughs> yes, we were talking about superheroes in in tight pants and you know silicone dresses and a grimace on their face. You need to look at your pencil boxes and pouches, children sitting here. No superhero or heroine smiles at all. You're all very deadly serious about saving the world. It's incredible. What do you think about the cult of the superhero? How does it? Don't you long, I'll ask you first. How does it affect uh, children and what does it do to them? I think there are different I think there are different types of superheroes. Some of them are anti-heroes. Yes, true. And uh I think part of the beauty of storytelling is that you cannot read or listen to a story without using your imagination. That's true. Uh, I can watch a film and my imag- imagination can be asleep. True. whereas when i read a story hmm. i have to imagine myself right and i have to think beyond my own circumstances true and maybe you have to make choices like who am i the most like in this narrative yes. it forces you yes, to yes. make those affinities yes there was some interesting research done some years ago with children and surprisingly when they were asked the question who are your role models a very large majority chose their own parents wonderful and i think this choice of role model is very important and this comes back to the superhero theme true if the superheroes embody the great values of humanity beauty goodness and truth i i think they can be great role models they can be great role But, models uh, that's true okay. and yet there are competing you know uh, views that uh, they foster um a kind of um you know 
they, they foster a kind of belief that someone's out there to fix your problems also. That's the other, uh, Mr. Lal wants to say something yeah, about it. So I think you're right. And uh, the other thing is that a lot of kids might also say that, you know, what's the point of reading all this? This guy's a superhero. He can do whatever he likes. We can't do that. True. Because if you can relate to your the character in the book and say that, you know, hey, you know, if I, I can actually do this, I can try this, I can do it. Mm -hmm. Because if he could do it and he's an ordinary person, True. Why can't I do that? The same thing. He doesn't have any supernatural powers. He can't jump over skyscrapers, skyscrapers mm. which I can't do either. Mm. So, I mean, it's sort of... I, I like stories where, there's, where you can equate reality. You, know, you mm. can make an equation straight between the character in the book and yourself. Mm -hmm. That's true. Those affinities are important. You want, want to say something? Uh, about yeah, about superheroes, they don't necessarily have to be people like, you know, jump off the roof. And uh, one of my great ideals is Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. And he said, they imprisoned me for 27 years, but they could not imprison my mind. Mm -hmm. In my mind, I was free. His body was in the jail, which is why when he came out, he didn't carry any bitterness. He said, if I allowed the bitterness, I would still be in the jail. So I just want all of you to know that you can be whoever you want to be. True. You don't need to have money. You don't have to have influence. You just have to have the power of your own mind hmm. to do good, to see good, and to imagine that was who Mandela was. For 27 years, anyone else would have been demoralized. Mm. But he said, no, my mind is free. Mm. So every one of you, your mind is free. True. So use your mind, you know, to, uh, to do good to others. And, and he was a smiling and, superhero. And just to add. He yeah. was the greatest superhero. He was a great superhero. But in addition to doing good and all that, because you're kids, you should also do mischief. Yes, <laughs> Because if you don't do mischief, you won't learn anything. That's very good <laughs> advice. I can see the children <laughs> nodding vigorously and the teachers looking at them and sort of saying, don't even try. <laughs> so, yes, very true. You have to do some mischief as well. That's the real world, right? That's the real world. I was also uh, talking, Dr. Long, about, uh, you were saying, you know, children today are exposed to many competing narratives out there in the world. Do you want to speak a little bit about it? You know, what are the narratives they're listening to and prioritizing in their mindscapes? I think by that I mean that there are many different versions of what it is to be a human being okay. and what it is to live a life that allows us to flourish True. and be happy. True. You know, uh, for some, that narrative is about the acquisition of wealth and material possessions. True. For others, it, it, it is about living a life that is virtuous. True. Uh, a life of self-sacrifice. True. Uh, so I think these are competing stories. Mm -hmm. And some of them are very driven by purely materialistic mm -hmm. paradigms. Right. Um, there is the story of science. There is the story of the materialistic universe. Right. But then there is also the story of the ancient spiritual and religious traditions of humanity. Right. And these are competing narratives. They sure. do not all tell the same story. Yes. We need to be sure that the stories our children are inspired by True. inspire them to be better than they are. Right. To reach out for those things that are purer, higher, higher and nobler. Right. That moves the human race forward. Wonderful. That plays things forward. Right. Wonderful. I think there is a tremendous responsibility that rests with children's authors um, in the sense that um, I wanted to ask all of you, in this world, in this deeply polarized and quickly polarizing world in many places, what stories could children be told that foster secular democratic values that build them into good members of a civil society? What stories would the 21st century child uh, be told? What do you think, Mr. Lal? I think basically most, uh, all children, when you just take away their backgrounds and all that are basically the same, basically the same True. people. So if you put a whole bunch of people, of kids, say, from different areas of the world, into, say, you take them to an... Well, actually, William Golding did that in uh, Lord of the Flies. He put them on an island and they turned into little tribal m monsters. Well, you can change the story. But I think, basically, there's a certain automatic, inbuilt 
decency mm -hmm. that one child has for another. You know, they may be a little hostile initially. I've seen the way, you know, when kids meet, they sort of first a little susp susp you know, suspicious of each other, and then they start sort of, you know, the barriers start falling down. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, they're friends. And they don't think about, you know, uh, which, where do I come from, or what's my religion, or what's this and that. They say, let's have a good game. Let's have, let's right. have some, some fun. Right. Um, I can see a lot of young faces in the audience. Maybe they'd like to hear what made you into the people that you are. What reading and what stories made you? What were you reading when you were at their, you know, their stage in life? What shaped your mind? And, and your being. Uh, Ms. Govindan, do you want to answer that first? Um, yeah, I was always, I think to be a writer, you have to be a reader. Mm -hmm. So as a young child, I read a lot. Um, I traveled the world. My father was a career diplomat. So I think to some extent, travel is one of the best ways of learning. As a young child, I traveled all over the world. And I was truly a global citizen in that way. I had no idea that, you know, I belonged to India or that I was an Indian or what my religion was. I had no idea until I grew up. So in that way, I would relate to children from all across the world. And I would read Winnie the Pooh, A.A. A. Milne was my, what, my, what can I say, my hero, <laughs> my favorite. And yeah, I read a lot of books. I also read a lot of comic books. I say this because modern parents don't like their children to read comic books. So I, I, I never ask my children not to read. I let them read whatever they liked. In a way, I think you have to read a lot to know what really appeals to you. That's true. So I allowed my children, of course. Um, uh, she, Ms. Bhattacharya was telling me that she... In her school, there are parents who curate their child's reading list. <laughs> Mercifully, uh, my parents never, they were too busy and they never bothered. So I would pick and choose my own books, which was a, a nice thing because then I found what I liked. Mm -hmm. So I was allowed to read whatever I liked. There was a healthy dose of realistic stories and fairy tales. In the time when I was a child, there was no Kindle. Hmm. I still do, I'm not very happy with the Kindle. I like the feel of the book. The I like the smell of the book. True. I like to turn the pages True. rather than to switch on <laughs> an electronic device. True. One of my children gave me a Kindle, so I've been trying to tell them to take it back <laughs> because I prefer my books, frankly. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, I grew up... Uh, reading, I think at that time there was only people like Enid Blyton and all that. But even at that time, you know, you used to get completely flummoxed because she used to go on and on and on. It is a bright and sunny day and the sun is out and here the sun is out 380 days out of 360. <laughs> what the hell is she gassing on about the sun? I mean, it doesn't make sense. But yeah, there was the adventure element of that. But later on, you know, as I told you, I had two sisters. Now, the elder one was very deep into reading and all that. And summer holidays used to come and we used to come home from the library with a heap of comics. She used to say, put those away. Here's my reading list for you for these holidays. Starting off with Charles Dickens, you know, Great Expectations. Nothing less than 500 wo uh, pages. <laughs> all the classics, you will read these in these holidays. You have a problem, you ask me. Don't understand a word, look at the dictionary make a list and get on with it. And, I, you know, initially there's always a bit of a, you know, you, you sort of resist. But then I found I was actually enjoying them, enjoying these books. And books like, you know, Scarlet Pimpernel, The Three Musketeers, those, those are absolute favorites, to even now. Count of Monte Cristo, True. I love them. And, you know, because they really got you into the story properly. True. And uh, after that, you just read. And even now, she, you know, she rings up from America, say, you know, there was this fabulous article in the New York Times. I'm sending it to you. Read it. <laughs> There's this fabulous book. See if you can get it from the library or I'll get it, get it for you. And most of the time, you know, I like what she sort of said. She sort of sent and uh, uh, advises. So a lot of my reading has been based on what her recommend sort of recommendations are. Now I'm finding that I am in the, also in the position to recommend books to her. <laughs> so <laughs> I've enjoyed that very much also. 
wonderful. Dr. Long, what were you reading as a young person? A lot of young people in the audience. I think my experiences were very similar to what my friends here have shared. Uh, the only other thing that I would add is that I was absorbed by science fiction, fascinated by it, mm. drank it constantly. But uh, the experiences you both shared were very, very similar to mine. And I really empathize with the absence of some of the technological aids and distractions. Mm. I, I didn't have to contend with that True. at all. True. The digital world has its own sort of place and its distractions as we were speaking about. Um, and as a last, we were also speaking about the demands of the market and the publishers. And Ms. Govindan was uh, hoping there'd be some publishers in the audience who are listening to the travails of people who want to tell real stories. Now, do you want to talk about it a little? And then Mr. Lal can add to it. Uh, so, yeah, so when we write a story, even if we uh, feel that the story is relevant and it's a funny or interesting story, we have to send it to a publisher. Now, even if the publisher likes the story, it doesn't mean the publisher is going to buy the story because the publisher has to sell the book in the market. True. And unfortunately, that is driven by commercial considerations. One of my very early picture books, um, so a picture book can be in two colors or in four colors. Now, if it is in two colors, it's just like black and gray. And if it's in four colors means it's a brightly colored book. So one of my early books, it was in two colors because the publisher said, I can't spend more money. The first time I took the book to a school, the children said, but why are the pictures so dull? <laughs> so for small children, I have found visual books, visual images are very important, mm -hmm. which is where when I visited uh, America for the first time, I was so taken up by the children's literature there. There are books even for six-month-old children, sure. which are just pictures, bright pictures. Whereas in India, we still don't have like a children's book market. It's in the nascent stages. Anyone from uh, zero to 18 years is a child. Yes, that's true. <laughs> so it's very difficult uh, in India as, as a writer of children's literature mm. to find a publisher who has the same, um, what can I say, dream for your book that you have. True. And of course they are, now it is improving. But I still think we have a long way to go. But um, I'm enthused by the fact that many children want to be writers. So I hope maybe in the next generation, the situation is going to improve. Wonderful. Yeah. We were talking about the fact that very often, uh, children's book or young adult fiction lands up only in children's hands. Whereas it's also the adults who might benefit from reading them. And therefore I ask you, why should adults read children's book? What's the benefit, you think, of adults reading children's books? Well, when you know, people ask me, I mean, uh, what age group do you write for? I say I write for children between the ages of 10 and 100. <laughs> so, I mean, if, you, if you've got a bit of your childhood, even beyond your 18 or 19, you will read those books. And they will always have something for you, because even in, the, in your role as a parent or as a teacher or as whatever, you will have some reference to, hey, maybe this is what these children are thinking, or at least this is what these author thinks that children are thinking. True. And it does, it will broaden your scope to that, that extent. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, especially these days, children are, I mean, parents are so busy with their work. You know, they're nine to five, both parents working, no time for anything. You read this kind of a story and which illuminates a different aspect, mm -hmm. which you have not thought about because you maybe did not have the time to think about it. True. It, it could influence your, the way you sort of deal with your kid. True. And I think a shared story between a parent and a child yeah. or an adult, any adult relationship, uh, is a different kind of bonding and intimacy which nothing else can bring. A shared meal and a shared book, that's it. Do you agree? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So? It, would, it would strengthen the bond because you have the same common factor there. This, you know, this, this is a book that is, we both read and we both sort of think about and talk about or whatever. Absolutely. Um, I can see that uh, there may be questions from the audience. A uh, lot of uh, people, uh, you know, hands going up and people, ex you know, hoping to ask. Yes, 
uh, we shall quickly take a couple yeah. of yeah. questions yeah. from yeah. the audience. Yeah, yeah. because uh, we are mindful of the time. Uh, there's a mic going around, yes. Yeah, Mr. Lal, my question to you is, you s said something about the female infanticide. Pardon? Yeah. You said yeah. something yeah. about the female infanticide. Yeah. What do you think? The sex determination test shall be done or shall not be done? A. Second, it is a question to the all panelists. How much important it is your adolescent psychology? Because very much less work is being done in, in India in, ado in adolescent psychology because the whole world changes. Mm -hmm. From the age of 11 to 18, True. the children's world change takes a whole changeover, which affects their whole life. So I want your uh, comments yeah. on these two points. I think as far as uh, sex determination tests are concerned, Maybe it would be a good idea to ban it until the time we have better sense. Better sense dawns on the whole public that, you know, it's not, it does not mean that girls are going to be sacrificed or, you know, removed. We have to change that mentality first, perhaps. Mm. But your uh, second question was... Just, was just, just a minute. I'll yeah. come to your answer, what answer you gave to me. Yeah. If we have a record that this fetus is a female fetus yeah and we ensure that this fetus will be carried nine months and nobody is allowed that fetus to be terminated we correct but you must have a system which is not that is absolutely foolproof and not corrupt who will say oh, it doesn't matter take you know what we are like if there's a rule we will find a way around it that's true we are not finding we are so yeah, that's the no. only thing you have to keep in mind. Otherwise, yeah, it's a good idea. Maybe it's a good idea. You could say that if you've got a little girl there, she is she is going to be born. Because you've got to be born. That that's the end of it. Yeah, it's it's non-debatable, I guess. Yes. See, one of the reasons I think we have to think why are the female fetuses killed? They are killed because the parents feel they are expensive. They have to be educated, that's fine, but they have to be given money when they get married. That's true. Dowry and go. So the first thing is, you should not give or take dowry. So when we are doing these kind of things, if we have a son, we think that, oh, we want a girl who will give us so much of dowry. You are actually putting other people into trouble. No, it is not only the dowry, I think. It yes. Is, that is only one part of it. Yes. It is other... Other things also which matters in life. If you, you I don't know whether you have seen the picture Pink or not. Pink, Pink, picture Pink. The film called Pink. Pink. Film called I Pink. No. no. I've heard of it. Yeah. There, the girl is molested okay. by four friends, so-called friends, who took three girls to a farmhouse. And then after mixing their drinks or something, they tried to molest them. And then when they went to lodge the FIR, FIR was not lodged because they were children of the influential people. The picture made on In that, there is a scene. The heroine, she is walking with Amdhaab Bachchan in, in the garden. Three or four, well, they were four, people they were crossing and they indicate, see, she is the girl who is in that case. So girl immediately puts on a cap and tries to hide her face. Amitabh Bachchan takes off his, her cap and that one act is spoke thousands of thousands of words. That thing, or removing the cap from that girl's face, you spoke thousands of words. And my second question about the. Sir, if you could just keep uh, it a little short, I think we. About, about, about a little constrained for time. Puberty psychology. Yeah, there, I mean, there was a question about, you know, how do you as authors integrate the uh, young. We were speaking about it, young people and their, uh, you know, emerging. Uh, identities uh, into your writing, into your characters? Maybe that can be a general question. Yeah, like it's very simple, you know, 
the moment you hit 13 or 14, boys are going to get interested in girls and girls are going to get interested in boys. There's basically no getting away from that. Now, how you deal with that is, well, what is our job kind of, as writers. We have to tackle that situation and uh, figure out what is the best way that kids going through all these traumas uh, can, you know, overcome them. Because I speak to a, a child psychologist who go to school and they say this is the major problem kids come to us with, relationship issues. Of this age, so, you know, because it, it's natural. It happens to everybody. It's happened to you, it's happened to me, it's happened to everybody. So there's no getting away, but we do get over it ultimately. So it, the thing is to, in your stories, see how you can get get the situation over with. I think it is better to teach our sons rather than the girls what is yeah. to be done, what is not to be done. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, right. Because we, because. Oh. We teach the girls, don't wear this, don't do that, don't do exactly. that. Exactly, right. That's true, absolutely. absolutely. It, 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 is, it is the sons who should be taught yes. that yes, there is a female and how right. you should get the female girl. Correct, absolutely. I agree. Yeah, true. I mean, talking about consent to both the genders and, uh, you know, teaching or discussing consent or the notion of consent is a central a need, perhaps. You deal with, uh, you deal with young people in your schools as well. Maybe Dr. Long wants to talk a little bit about it. How do you tackle these issues? How do you teach or, or talk about consent or issues of consent to your young students? I think these are very sensitive and controversial themes. Very. And the context in which we discuss them with young people is terribly important. And also young people, certainly in my school, come from so many different cultures and backgrounds. Sure and some of the stories they come with, some of the narratives which define them, are not mutually compatible. They are actually telling completely different stories. Different stories. And sometimes we have to create an environment where people can listen to each other with deep respect. As someone once said, seek first to understand, then to be understood. So I'm not addressing the question specifically. Absolutely. I'm no, no. describing the environment. Sure. We have to create the right environment first. Right. Exactly. The right container yeah. I mean, to that's, hold this that's true. controversy. And it's, it's a very big topic. I mean, it's another, it's another panel altogether, if at all. Yes. It must be very difficult to do. Yes. Must be. Uh, one or two more young people. I think I would like some young people to ask children to ask. I think. Young lady here and then one there, we'll take the question. Young lady right in front, I've seen your hand as well. Very quick, if you could keep it quick. Well, just uh, diverting the topic a bit, I would just like to ask that when you're writing a book, is the essence of the message important or the content uh, by which the reader will actually fall upon is more important? A wonderful question. Anyone would like to answer this? I think that depends on the story, the way you tell it. There are no two ways. I mean, I can't tell you that tell it this way. You are a storyteller, so it depends on how it comes out from you. The me don't worry about the message. Just tell the story the way it comes out, naturally. If the story is well told, the message will be there. True. Right. So don't worry about the message too much. <laughs> Mr. Lal, you wanted to add something? No, that's absolutely true. Let the story do the yeah. message telling, True. not the other way around. Maybe delight and message, I mean the notion of delight in a story, the content, and the notion of the message which may be subtle. They're not, nat I mean they're not at loggerheads with one another. Sometimes the message is the story itself and the characters. I think there was a young lady at the back who was raising her hand for a long time. If the mic could be, uh, yeah. Thank you so much, panel. I would just like to ask, uh, today we were talking about children and storytelling to them. But even I have witnessed this thing that we are more technologically influenced than reading the books. So how do you think it's affecting the imagination of our generation? Because obviously when we are digitalizing things, then imagination is deteriorating that I find in the content that we get today. So how can we improve that? 
just to get your question are you talking about how content is unimaginative or are you asking how does you know how does the digital world yes no ma'am i'm just asking that how can the content be more impressive for the writers of today like if i want to write how can my content be more impressive to the students who are reading it how will it compete with the digital world okay uh, how how does the written word and the author uh, compete with this world where i think you should never underestimate the power of the, the written word sure. you know i mean you look at all these huge big dictators who rule countries who are the first people they jail when they come to power poets and writers so not not because they soft targets because they know that these guys can do then more damage than any number of tanks and rockets and stuff like that so never underestimate that power that you have in the in the written word and you just forget about that digital thing is, is always there but the digital thing is also very much more i think uh, you know you forget it very quickly i mean i don't remember anything i've read on my computer screen as i would if i had read it in a book it sticks much more when i read it in a book and it it sort of it just happens that way so but never underestimate the power of that that have written word true and one last question gentleman in front had raised his hand if if the mic could come to him before we wrap the session up finally so anybody could answer this as you people write stories for children i mean what do you people have in mind right which uh, do you people focus on some age group of a children or a state of mind i mean how do you people define a creature to be child like uh, by following the societal uh, age group that we have like uh, if a person is 18 and then turns 18 plus one day he is an adult or by the state of mind this is what i wanted to ask okay tough question how do you decide your audiences age this should be by state of mind i guess because you know like for example in this nana is a nut case i have children who are from the ages of 7 to 16 in the same story now they have to deal with the situation and they deal with it in different ways like their nana gets dementia which means he forget now for the two little ones who are twins that can be a great advantage because nana has forgotten that he's given them their pocket money three times already in that one week but for the older children it is something more serious because they realize they know what it's about and what could happen and all that so it you have to put your mind into the framework that what would a child of this age probably be thinking if this sort of thing were happening at home and in this story at least it's the little two ones who are giving nana the treatment even his neurologist gives him because they are asking him they are scared that he might forget who he is who they are so every morning they say who are who are home i who are you what is your name what did you eat for breakfast what did you eat for dinner how many cars do you have exactly the same question in neurologists would ask without realizing so you see i how children different children from different age groups will react differently according to the situation to each situation sure. so you have to just put yourself in those you could say age brackets i hate that term age brackets you know exactly. because it's very confining it's uh, it is really i mean there are some people who have children at i mean I'm a, when people ask me my age i say oh i've been 25 for the last 35 years i mean i would ask what determines <laughs> being a child <laughs> what is the age what determines a no, person no it's a minus i mean it's a kind of character that you have imagined sure. in your in your head do you want to say add something to that He's answered it. Yes. Thank you for the question. I guess we have to wrap up. Truly, ideas are radical, and ideas are to be feared. That's why poets get shot first. Authors get shot first. The first bullet in any insurrection is, I mean, any dictatorship is reserved for writers. And children's writing is also uh, powerful in its own way because it molds young minds. With that, we come to an end, to the end of a very wonderful session. Lots of. um topics uh, dealt with and thank you for being a very attentive audience asking some very good questions indeed i hope you enjoyed the session a big thank you to everyone uh, our authors and dr long who came along and you know gave their precious time and a very good afternoon thank you thank you so much ms bhatcharya thank you all of you uh, it's been a great session 
and uh, I would like to request whoever wants to get the book signed. Uh, there's a book signing corner right there, and the authors will be there. You can pick up the big books from the uh, bookstore. Thank you so much. Can you have a big round of applause for all of them, please? And uh, before you leave, uh, we would like to invite um, Mrs. Gitanjali Hemant Kocher, uh, the owner of um, Madhuban Group of Hotels, to facilitate uh, all our guests. Welcome, ma'am. And we have a, a nice uh, warm welcome to all of them. Now you can clap louder, you can clap louder. Come on, come on, ladies and gentlemen. It's afternoon time, you have more energy now. I'm just kidding. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. Thank you so much.